Today is uh, August 18th, uh, August 17th, I'm sorry, 1999. We're here at the University of Miami with Justice Gerald Kogan. Uh, I'm Philip Gerson. Uh, Justice Kogan, tell us how your background and uh, training uh, shaped your career and your thinking as a lawyer. Well, that's about as broad a question as you can possibly ask. Obviously, everything you do in life has going to have some effect on what your future is going to be like, uh, the way you think, the way you act, and the success that you're going to have in life. So I look at this as being a situation where you've got to do everything you possibly can to not only enjoy life, but to be a productive member of society. Work hard, uh, don't look for excuses if things fail, but just try to correct the things that went wrong and try to enhance those things that are going right. And I always believe in the great philosophy and that is that the same people that you pass on the way up the ladder of success are the same people that you're gonna pass on the way down. And unless you intend to stay on the top forever, and there are very few people that ever do that, then you've got to say to yourself, I want to be treated the same way when I'm coming down as I treated others as I pass them on the way up. In other words, it's a version of the golden rule, and that is do unto others as you would have them do unto you. Unfortunately, uh, there are a lot of people today who uh, pervert that and say you do unto others before they do unto you. But I don't believe that at all. I think that you, in your life you must treat people in such a way where you yourself would want to be treated. So in other words, if I'm a judge sitting on the bench, say in the trial court, I would treat the attorneys, the litigants, the jurors, the witnesses, court personnel in the same way in which I would want to be treated if I were in their position. And I find that's always the key to success because people basically want to be treated as human beings and want to be treated in a fair manner. And I think when you do that, then that's one of the keys to success in life. What we're uh, interested in, in in this series is professionalism, and that philosophy that you just expressed sounds like really the heart of professionalism. How do you relate that to the concept of professionalism? Well, let me go back. I remember when I was a teenager, I was working at a hotel at a summer job, and the working conditions there were less than desirable and a lot of people were quitting and leaving and everything else. And I remember calling my dad one day on the telephone and saying, you know, the conditions here are very, very bad. I'm just going to leave this job. And he said to me, oh, no, you're not. He said, you promised those people up there that for this summer you would work up there and you knew some of the conditions under which you were going to work. He says, and it's not fair to them for you to leave them in a lurch at this particular time. He says, I don't care how bad things are supposedly up there, you're going to fulfill your obligations under your contract. And that stayed with me, I think, throughout my life. And that is, if you make a commitment, then by God, you have to stay with that particular commitment. And consequently, I think I really patterned my life that way. I've been in situations where others have quit and given up. But since I've had the obligation, I've stayed with it to do what I think is the proper thing to do. And I think when you talk about professionalism, that's what you're talking about. In other words, what's my job as a lawyer? My job as a lawyer, if I'm representing an individual, is to represent that individual within the ethics and within the law as best I possibly can. And to do anything less for that person is not to be professional. And consequently, that's always been my philosophy in life. Is there a difference between professionalism and ethics? I like to say no. I think that people try to make a distinction. And they try to make a distinction by saying, well, you know, if it's not governed, governed by the rules of conduct uh, governing judges or attorneys, you know, then okay, you can slip around here or slip around there as long as you don't directly violate any of those uh, ethical requirements. To me, professionalism means, you know, more than that, although it encompasses the ethics. And that is that it's not just what the canons may prohibit you from doing. It's what common sense tells you 
is not proper and not right. In other words, when people look at you as a lawyer, they've got to know and have got to understand that they are dealing with someone who's going to treat them fairly, who's going to represent them properly under all circumstances. And if you don't, then you're not professional, in my opinion. Are there limits on what we should do to further the interests of our client that are set by the needs of professionalism? Oh, I certainly think so. In other words, uh, clients, as you know, can make some outrageous demands upon lawyers. And you just can't, if the thing the client wants you to do is obviously wrong, you don't do it. Even though it may inure to the benefit of the client for you to do something wrong, you just don't. Because not only does it hurt you as an individual, it hurts the entire profession. So, yes, do for your client that which you can. But within the rules of the law, within the rules of ethics, and also common sense. Just because the code of ethics doesn't address something, that doesn't mean that it's okay to do it. Because common sense will tell you, no, that's just not right. And consequently, that's always been my philosophy. Do lawyers owe a higher duty to the profession than to their clients? I think by representing your client in the way that I've discussed with you really elevates the lawyer to the highest standards of the profession. Because if the lawyers act in that way, then I think that they are doing the profession a very good service. Is it acceptable for lawyers to be motivated by a desire to make money? Well, I think obviously all of us have to pay bills. And consequently, it's necessary that we be somewhat financially successful in our endeavors. But I think when you decide that the quest for the almighty dollar is the only purpose in practicing law, then you're in, in my opinion, the law profession for the wrong reasons. We are basically a profession that gives service to the public. Let's face it, the average citizen does not have the know-how to navigate their way through the legal system, whether it be in drawing a will or a contract or a real estate closing or being in court during a trial. We as the profession have the training and have the responsibility to be able to guide them successfully through that particular system. And uh, consequently, I think that is the greater good. I believe that if you're an honest, upright, and ethical and professional lawyer, then the financial rewards will come. Now, there are some of us that may have to say, well, I can't make all the money in the world, you know, doing, you know, what you're just saying I should do. But my philosophy is and scale down, you know, the standard of living. There's nothing that says that every attorney has to uh, drive a Rolls Royce or a Mercedes or live in a million dollar mansion by the sea. There's nothing at all that says that. I mean, you can drive a Chevrolet, you can live in a very nice home. And uh, you can go to Europe, you know, maybe once a year if you want on vacation, but yet at the same time, not making the almighty dollar the necessary ingredient of success in law. I think too many people say the more money you make, the more successful you are. As what? As a money maker or as a lawyer? And I think as a money maker, yes. As a lawyer, no. Unless you're giving the service within the realm of professional responsibility that we've talked about. Do you think that the members of the profession uh, give enough of their time to the public good for goals that are not related to making money? Oh, I think many of them do, and I think you and I both know that. We just see the number of lawyers that participate you know, in government, the number of lawyers that participate in charities and uh, lend their time and their efforts to really doing public good. I'd like to see more of us doing that, but I think that as a profession, we do a very good job, and I'm very proud of my fellow lawyers and what they accomplish in society and the way they help society and not for financial gain. I know a lot of people say, well, you have to join all these different organizations because that's how they're going to bring in clients. Well, I'm not so sure how many clients uh, these contacts really bring in, and quite frankly, I think most lawyers really look upon this as being an opportunity to serve their community as opposed to a moneymaker for them. It seems that lawyers have, over the past 30 or 40 years, lost some of the public's respect. What can we do to earn it back? 
Well, I think there's always going to be a certain amount of controversy dealing with the legal profession. After all, we are an adversarial system, and if you're involved in, say, litigation, uh, there's a tendency to blame the lawyer on the other side, and in some cases, blame your own lawyer for your having lost the case. Uh, this, of course, by the very nature of our system, we can never overcome. However, I think, and I'm a great believer in this, that pro bono work, is an excellent way for lawyers to enhance the vision of the profession. In other words, we're not a greedy bunch of money-grubbing individuals, but we are people who are out there for the purpose of serving our clients first. And the financial rewards are really a secondary and should be. I think if we dedicated more of our time in that regard, we'll be a lot better off. Is there anything that you can think of which we can do to reshape the media's portrayal of us? I think through good deeds is the only way you're going to do that. You know, I often tell, I've told clients in the past and other public officials that unless you have a newspaper or a radio or TV station, there's no way you can fight the media. So I think, and for the most part, I, it's been my experience, and I've had a lot of contact with the media through my career, that if you're honest and above board with them, and you don't give them the idea that you're hiding anything, the story more than likely is going to be favorable. And I know that's hard for a lot of people to understand, but you do have in the media, as same as you have in any other profession, those individuals who want to do a good job, who want to do a professional job in their profession. And I think when you have a meeting of the minds and they can trust you as a human being and as an individual, then I think our profession is going to be a lot better off. I applaud, for example, Edith Osmond's uh, attempt at the, during her administration as president of the Florida Bar to spread the word about how lawyers are, in fact, you know, an honorable, responsible profession. And we are. And I'm not just saying that because I'm a lawyer and I've been a judge, but from what I've observed, I think the average lawyer wants to do what's right and wants to act in a responsible manner. As a matter of fact, the Commission on Professionalism, which I had the privilege of signing the order creating that at the request of the Florida Bar, was an indication that the Florida Bar was willing to indulge in whatever activity was necessary to enhance the perception of lawyers as being professionals. And this came as a grassroots effort through the lawyers themselves, which really is to their credit. Do you think it's been effective in improving the standards of professionalism in our state? I think it's made lawyers more aware of their duties and responsibility as professionals. Now, whether or not it has yet reached the point where it has an impact upon society's perception of lawyers, I think it's still early to tell. But we should know, you know, in the not too distant future. Over the many years that you served as a jurist, both at the trial and the appellate levels. How has your thinking changed? How did your, would you describe the maturity of your thinking over this span of years? Well, obviously, uh, unless you're completely unaware of what's going on around you naturally, you're going to mature and your philosophy is going to change. And I think that uh, as we're very active in our law practices. Sometimes we lose sight of, you know, the professional responsibility that we owe. Uh, when you're on the bench, you're able to sit back a little bit more and really look at this and study it a little bit more and begin to realize that there are ways in which perhaps we could have changed our behavior on the way up. And I look at life as always being a learning process. When you stop learning, you're dead. And I would rather keep on learning. How can technology help foster professionalism? I think it gives us greater access to the general public. For example, uh, when I was Chief Justice of the Supreme Court, I decided to go ahead and put our oral arguments on TV live. And we were able to use our state educational satellite. Uh, we had 50 cable companies throughout the state of Florida that picked this up and they would go ahead and broadcast it into 1.3 million homes. Now, I don't know how many of those people were watching, but a lot more than you can realize. We also had them live over the internet. They did wonderful graphics on it. They would show the people what the issue was during the argument and the position of both sides. 
And a lot of people would come up to me and say, you know, we have a greater understanding now of what's going on in the legal system now that we see these arguments. And I feel these are things that we need to keep doing. We need to tell the public, look, it's your legal system, and you have the right to know what's happening within that system. And I think as they begin to learn what the system is about, I think we're going to be a lot better off as a profession and as a society. So this is a way of showcasing the professionalism of the practice in contrast with the unseemly side that the media too often emphasizes? Yes, I think without any question whatsoever. And I think it behooves us as lawyers to act in a professional manner. Now, for example, you know what happens inside courtrooms or in hearing rooms where the attorneys start going at each other. Well, obviously, as I tell litigants in front of me, don't argue with each other because you're not going to win the argument with each other. I'm the one you have to convince. So direct all your comments to me. And it has a very good effect upon the attorneys who realize, you know, anyway, what he's saying is really true. Let's stop wasting our time arguing with each other. We're getting nowhere. The person we have to convince is the judge or the judges that are sitting up on the bench. And judges have a lot to do with the professionalism in their courtrooms. I think the judges themselves have to act in a professional manner in their treatment of all the persons that appear in front of them. And judges can set the tone as to what goes on in that courtroom. And I notice, you know, over the years through my observations that those judges who do a good job and who give each side a fair hearing and treat everyone, as I said before, the way they would like to be treated if they were in their position, gen get the respect and generate the respect from the attorneys. And those judges who don't, who get involved so-called in the fray, who try to assert their authority in a dictatorial manner, and we do have judges that are like that, uh, what happens is everything goes downhill from there because the attorneys, you know, get angry and the entire hearing degenerates. So as I say, it's a dual responsibility. It's the attorneys and the judges who are going to be the ones that are the key to civility in the courtroom and outside the courtroom. How can we improve professionalism from the bench? Well, the way I pointed out, I think that the judges themselves have to let the attorneys know that in their courtrooms no nonsense is going to take place, that people must behave themselves, must treat each other with respect, and, you know, if necessary, call a sidebar and bring the attorneys around and tell them, you know, you know you're both nice lawyers, you know, you're good lawyers and the whole thing, but if you keep up this activity, you know, I hate to see any of you spending your nights preparing the next day in jail for contempt of court. And that has a very, very soothing effect. <laughs> uh, but that shouldn't have to happen. The judge, by his or her actions, should very rarely ever have to resort to that. I was a judge for 18 and a half years. And on only on one occasion did I ever hold anybody in contempt of court. And that was a litigant who showed up intoxicated on drugs and fell down on the courtroom floor in front of the jury. That was the only time I ever did that. I felt, you know, just a little hint to the lawyers at sidebar was sufficient to make sure that they conducted themselves in a professional manner. And I think the lawyers appreciate that as well. From the, uh, from the vantage point of the Supreme Court, have you seen uh, a change or a development in the professionalism of the bench and bar below that? I think that we're more cautious of what we do now, both as judges and lawyers. I remember when I was uh, chair of the Gender Bias Study Commission, people said to me, eh, you're not going to ever be able to do anything about the problem, the gender gap, and all those things. And I discovered that after we issued our report and after having hearings around the state, that in fact we did. People became very conscious of the fact that gender discrimination or discrimination of any type is not proper. And consequently, I think it made us a better bar and a better bench because of it. And I think you can do the same thing with professional responsibility. Constantly, we're reading about this in the Florida Bar News, the Florida Bar Journal, uh, as they go to uh, various bar meetings or seminars or CLE courses. They're being ingrained, you know, the fact that we need to act 
as a responsible profession. And I think it's very definitely taking hold. Now, whether or not the outside world perceives it or not, it's hard to tell at this point. But I know from my experience, and probably from your experience, that this has taken hold, that people are now talking about this and realize it's a necessity to carry this forward. And now that you've re retired from the Supreme Court, uh, you've really just moved on to another uh, theater to um, carry out your good work. Tell us something about your present uh, assignment. Well, back last fall, I was approached by the Alliance for Ethical Government, which is a cross-section, cross-gender, racial, ethnic lines, a group that was sick and tired of what was going on in Dade County with public corruption, with unethical conduct by public officials, and also by unethical conduct by people doing business with the county and with the various municipalities. And they wanted to do something about it, so they formed this private organization called the Alliance for Ethical Government. And originally there were like 135 original trustees. They approached me to be president of this particular group. And I saw this as an opportunity to do some more public service. And that is, can we clear up corruption in Dade County? I think we can make a dent in it. I think corruption, unfortunately, will always be with us in one form or another, and it's pie in the sky to think you're going to get rid of it all. But I think you can make a dent in it, and I think you can make a dent in it again by making people conscious of the fact that this is not the proper thing to do. Uh, some of the things that we have in mind, for example, uh, including codes governing lobbyists and public officials and people doing business with the county, is an educational program. Starting in kindergarten through the 12th grade and on into college, teaching our youngsters about ethics and the proper way to do things. Because, you know, let's face it, a democracy is only as strong as its electorate. I think that we must come back and give people another reason why they're going to go to the ballot box. Now, the turnouts in our elections here locally and, you know, throughout Florida, and unfortunately throughout the nation, are pitiful. I mean, they just had a referendum, uh, I think only 28% came out on that transit tax. People have to be informed as an electorate, and they have to realize that even though they may only have one vote, that that vote can count if everybody in mass gets out. But if you sit back and you're apathetic and you don't get out and vote, and you don't try to do something to improve the situation, it's like an open wound. It festers and gets worse, and gangrene sets in, you know, and then you have to amputate. We don't want that to happen. So while we cannot ever say for sure that we're going to eliminate all corruption, we can at least say that more people will begin to realize that that's not the way to do business. That all we're doing is it's hurting ourselves, giving ourselves a horrible reputation, and just harming the moral fiber of the community. And you don't want that to happen. Uh, my wife and I have lived 52 years in the state of Florida. And with the exception of the 12 and a half years in Tallahassee, the rest of that time, 40-some-odd uh, years were spent here in Dade County. I went to high school here. I went to undergraduate and law school here. So I take a lot of pride in this community. And I want to see us succeed. And I think we can succeed if we all get together, regardless of our religious, our ethnic, our racial, or gender. We can certainly do something about it. What can the role of law schools be in fostering professionalism? I think that's the key. I think from the very beginning, and most law schools do this, they have right up front for the incoming freshmen a program dealing with ethics. I know the University of Miami does. Tomorrow morning, I'm going up to Nova University to speak to their freshman class about ethics in the profession. Uh, Dean Harbaugh has put together an oath that I administered to the students up there wherein they pledge to follow the professional rules of ethics that conduct themselves in a professional manner, etc. In other words, right from the very beginning, letting them understand, instead of giving them a course in their senior year on ethics or professionalism, just highlight this all the way through. And what's your opinion of mentoring programs for young lawyers? I think that's absolutely essential. I remember when I... Uh, graduated from law school, that 
there wasn't a mentoring system. We had very few large firms. It was very, very difficult in those days for a young lawyer to get a job in Dade County. As a matter of fact, it was almost impossible to get one. Most of the time, you hoped that some lawyer would give you the back broom closet in his office in order for you to uh, do some work in return for that. But there wasn't really a mentoring system. We now have more of a mentoring system. But it's necessary. You have to work under the guidance of someone who has been around and can help you avoid the pitfalls that very easily you can fall into when you don't have that experience. You can graduate summa cum laude from law school, be editor of the law review, but yet don't have the foggiest idea as to what your professional responsibility is when you're out in the legal profession. Mentoring has a lot to do with helping you along. Do you think that a formal mentoring program by the bar would promote professionalism? I was the chair along with Alan Sundberg of the Bench Bar Commission, which was set up again by the Florida Bar in conjunction with the Supreme Court. Many of us advocated an internship system like the doctors and dentists have. And we advocated that because we felt that lawyers graduating law school were ill-prepared really to go out and practice law. There's a standard joke, you know, the law school graduate comes in the first day on the job, uh, the senior partner says, now take this on down to the courthouse and file it. And the first question out of the young associate is, where's the courthouse? So we've come a long way since that time. I mean, this was true when I graduated almost 45 years ago. Fortunately, it's not that way today. And a lot of it is because of mentoring. A lot of it is because of the coursework within the schools, the clinical work, where students are more aware now of the actual practice of law, uh, not just the academic side. And I think that uh, this is absolutely essential in preparing lawyers to go out and practice law. I know from um, prior speeches that I've heard you make that you have some uh, very strong views about the Supreme Court and the future of the Supreme Court and the death penalty. And we may be getting a little bit off the mm -hmm. track here, but since we're here in this setting, let me ask you if there's something you'd like to say about what you think the future of the Supreme Court should be. You mean in death penalty or just in general? I think the Supreme Court, of course, is the last bastion of hope for the average litigant. Unless you have a federal constitutional question, unless there's diversity of citizenship, you're not going to get into the federal court system. So for the overwhelming majority of litigants in the state of Florida, the Supreme Court is their last stop. Uh, I would like to see the Supreme Court be able to have a, uh, one of these jurisdictions where you can actually reach down and take a case that you find is interesting uh, and hear that case instead of the uh, strict rules that we go by now looking for conflicts. And I think that's essential for the court to have that power. The court has, as the years gone on, taken a very strong hand in administering the court system. I know every one of the justices, for example, serves as chair of committees and commissions and serves on committees and commissions, both from the Supreme Court and the bar in general. And I think making themselves more accessible to the bar, the rank and file bar, and the public, again, promotes a better understanding of what takes place in our court, both for the lawyers and for the citizenry. We did start it when Rosemary Barquette was our chief justice a number of years ago. We started each annual meeting of the Florida Bar, having a question and answer session between the court and the attorneys. And that is very, very beneficial. And we encourage the attorneys, don't worry about the questions that you're asking. You know, just don't ask us about something that's now pending in front of us. But uh, any questions at all about how the court operates, about the decision-making process, all this is absolutely necessary. And I think that if you have a court that is completely aloof and detached from the practice of law, you have a court that really is not helping with professionalism, with professional responsibility. I think the court has to take an active hand in that and let the attorneys know that the court appreciates what they're doing and the court will aid and assist them in whatever they need to do. You know, the attorneys are in fact officers of the court and any judge who's worth his or her salt will tell you that they would rather have the toughest legal question ever imaginable in front of them 
as long as they have two competent lawyers, one on each side arguing it, because then they know they're going to have the input they need to make an intelligent decision. The worst thing is to have a thorny legal problem and have one or both of the attorneys on the other side really not prepared, not really competent to argue it, and that's what really leads you into error and into mistake. So the courts depend upon the attorneys to a great extent to help them in making these decisions. And any judge who thinks that they know it all really shouldn't be a judge. We don't know it all. We were attorneys at one time, we're on the bench now. We still need the input from our fellow lawyers to help us make proper decisions. What do you think of the work ethic of today's lawyers? Well, you mean because they have to meet so many billable hours or they're really going out and working hard? Well, do they work hard enough? Well, from what I hear them say, they do. I mean, I hear some of these god-awful billable hours that they have to go ahead and put in, uh, especially for those who work on the larger firms with tremendous overheads. And uh, I think that they work hard. And, uh, as I say, it, it's difficult really to tell, you know, except on a person-to-person -person basis. Uh, we have lawyers who do excellent work in front of the court. Obviously, they've put in their homework. And some lawyers who I would be ashamed to file some of the briefs that some of them file in the front of the court. But I guess it's a case-by-case -case basis, uh, with, depending upon the individual lawyer. Do you have uh, anyone who you would say was a hero to you uh, as a young lawyer? Well, I think I learned most of what I know about trying cases as an attorney from Erwin Block. Erwin has been around a long time. Uh, he was basically one of my mentors in uh, the state attorney's office. That's where I learned how to try a case from Erwin, outstanding trial lawyer. Erwin is still practicing today. Great guy, outstanding lawyer, without any question. Uh, as far as uh, public service is concerned, I like Chesterfield Smith. I think despite the fact that he's head of the largest law firm in the state of Florida, and you would think that all the law firm might be interested in is making money, uh, Chesterfield looks upon being a lawyer as being an opportunity to do public service. And he has. And he's gotten many lawyers in his law firm and throughout the state of Florida to give of their time and their efforts you know, towards uh, doing a good job to help serve the public, not only in law, but in also allied fields as well. So, but there are so many others out there as well, you know, that I've admired over the years who have done an outstanding job. But those two come to mind. Are there any, any jurists who stand out particularly in your opinion? Oh yeah, there are very, some very good ones. Uh, on our court, uh, for example, two people that I really admired were uh, Rosemary Barquette and uh, Harry Anstead, who's on the court right now. I f maybe I appreciate them most of all because their judicial philosophy and philosophy of life is very, very similar to my own. So I don't mean to give short shrift to anybody else. I'm just really uh -huh. allying myself with those two because they, in fact, uh, are the ones that I've worked very, very closely with. Uh, there have been some very outstanding trial judges over the years, too, that I've admired. But uh, those two are the ones that I've worked most closely with as a judge. I know this may be such a broad question that it defies an answer, but could you uh, just describe your philosophy or your outlook after the many years you've spent in the profession? I think that lawyers owe a duty to the public, as I said, to help them win their way through the legal system. That is our training, that is the experience, and that is the privilege we have as being licensed by lawyers. And again, getting back to that golden rule, very simply, you must treat everyone every day as you would want to be treated if you were similarly situated as they are. I think that's a pretty good philosophy in life, and I think it's something that if you adhere to that, then life is a lot easier and runs a lot more smoothly. Is this, has the size of the profession and just the general growth in the number of courts and the, um, the volume of litigation something that makes that more difficult today than perhaps it was a generation 
ago? Well, I think certainly the overload of litigation today, we're a very litigious <laughs> society to say the least. I think that has a lot to do with the various ways in which we now do things. For example, mediation and arbitration. When I uh, started 45 years ago approximately, uh, you didn't have mediation. I mean, it just wasn't there. And the, I don't even know if the word had been invented at that time. There was arbitration, but it really didn't deal itself with the average attorney. That was something that uh, labor unions indulged in, you know, up in Washington or Chicago or something like that. But that's come a long way, too. Um, now we're even doing mediation on the appellate level. I think of necessity you're going to have to do that because you're never going to have all the resources that are necessary to have every case go to an end by having a trial and having a jury or the court sitting as the finder of fact rendering an opinion or a, a, a verdict in a particular case. So you have to find new ways to do things. The pretrial intervention programs that they have on the criminal side were absolutely essential. If you didn't have those, you couldn't try your criminal cases. Your jails would be bulging at the seams and you wouldn't be able to dispose of those cases. So these are things that we've had to develop. We have a new system now that an experiment that we've been trying up in Tallahassee and is now beginning to spread out called the Neighborhood Justice Center. And that is people are either referred there by the courts to solve disputes amongst friends and neighbors and people living in the community or people themselves come in there for mediation and it's done by you know trained mediators and this is something that you need in other words you and I both know that there are a lot of cases that are in the court system that shouldn't even be in there from the beginning that we can best solve you know by mediating these problems even before the first complaint is filed in a court these are things that we need to do and there are other things that are coming along now. Uh, for example, we're now developing the uh, computer conference. And I've seen that demonstrated very simply where the judge will sit in his or her office behind the computer screen and hook in with the lawyers, each one having a small little TV camera mounted on top of the computer. Uh, we're developing now, and of course the court reporters aren't too happy about it, but it's simultaneous transcription. Uh, we're now also having voice recognition computers. We started using those on the Supreme Court last year when I was there. And that is you don't even have to know how to type anymore. Uh, once you program that computer to get used to your voice, then all you need to do is say computer on, and then you just go ahead and dictate what you want to. So these are things that have come along to aid and assist us in doing these things. We now have, as you know, uh, television monitoring. I think the First District Court of Appeals now handles a lot of its appeals by way of uh, two-way TV arguments. And in other words, to prevent the attorneys from having to travel a long way to argue their cases. Uh, in the criminal system, they're using it for a long time now for their jail arraignments. So these are things that have been born of necessity because we know we don't have enough resources do it the ideal way. What's happened is litigation has become very, very expensive. Average person now, except in a contingency case, really can't afford to hire a lawyer if litigation is involved. I mean, they can afford, you know, real estate closing or have a will made or a contract drawn, but the cost of litigation is out of sight. So a lot of people are settling cases now where below what really should be the amount they're settling for because they know they can't go ahead and take it to court. It'll cost them more to take it than the return on your money. So uh, these are things you know that we have to work on and maybe find different ways to do it, etc. Is there a solution to that problem? I think we can find the solution. I think we must find the solution, wherever that solution may lie. Whether it be like the kiosks that they have out in Arizona, which don't necessarily work as good as they should, where people can actually have the kiosk give them will forms and property, real estate forms and things like that. Uh, a lot of these people, of course, don't go to lawyers. The biggest problem we have today is the pro se litigant, who is a nightmare for any judge. Judges don't like pro se litigants because they're put in a position of do they, they can't represent, but yet at the same time they have to protect the litigant. 
So these are things that we're going to have to work on, but we're resourceful enough. And as I said, I've mentioned the other things that we've done, you know, to help solve problems. And we'll come up with something else, I'm sure. Every day, you know, we're thinking about new things to improve and enhance the profession and the practice of law in the legal system. What challenge does the pro se litigant present for the lawyer opposing him to be professional? That, again, is a very, very difficult problem for the lawyer. And that is you want to protect your client, so you want to make the proper objections. You want to file whatever pleading you feel is necessary to file. But yet, at the same time, you're in a position where you say to yourself, I really can't take advantage of this person because that's not professional. So that's a situation that I hope that I would never be in. But unfortunately, a lot of lawyers are in that position. And it's just a judgment call. You just have to see what happens in a particular case. Uh, sometimes the judge can help out. Other times the judge has got to take a hands-off attitude. It's a severe problem. We have in uh, family law cases in some jurisdictions uh, more than 60% of the cases have at least one pro se litigant. And that's really not the way it should be. Now what the solution is going to be, whether or not we're going to have attorneys representing pro se litigants in the future, I don't know. A lot of the pro se litigants said they enjoyed their experience. If they had to do it again, they'd go in without a lawyer. So maybe even providing lawyers for them is not the answer because they don't want one. As we approach the, the millennium and a new century and a new era, what message do you have for the profession? Concentrate on what we're doing now to improve our image to the public. Uh, be more professional in everything that we do. Realize that we're not going to sacrifice everything for the almighty dollar. That we are, first of all, a service profession to serve the public. And let's concentrate on that first. The financial rewards will come automatically. Especially if you're a good lawyer, the word gets out and people will come. But we need to do away with a perception, which I think is really wrong, that we are overall a money-grubbing, greedy profession. Because I don't think we are. We do have those attorneys who fit that category. And they're attorneys that I wish, you know, would change their ways or we would get out of the profession. But for the overall lawyers, I think, just keep on doing what you're doing. Do an honorable job. Be responsible professionally for what you're doing. And I think the rest will take care of itself. Plus, we have to honk our own horn. I'm a great believer in, you know, you need publicity to show people what you're doing. Do you see an increased sensitivity from the profession to the needs and the goals of professionalism? Oh, yeah, very, very definitely, especially in the last several years since we started our Commission on Professionalism. Uh, I think that was there all along, but attorneys just needed a way to express it. They needed someone to mentor them, perhaps. And I think now that this is catching on, and we discover that the vast majority of our members of our profession want to do things in a professionally responsible manner. And that's a good sign. Are there any other thoughts that you would want to leave us with in this interview? No, nothing else. I think that, Phil, you've covered it all. And uh, I just hope, you know, that when the year 2001 uh, comes along, that during this coming year, that we've made even more progress. And I think we're going to do that. I think the bar and the court have, in fact, really committed themselves to this idea of professionalism. And I think it's going to succeed.